Okay. You've had resolution, resolution 20, 22 12 read, read in entirety. Is, is a resolution, resolution only one part of one reading? If there are no other questions, I have a motion to approve. Uh, make a motion. Motion made by Gary. Gary, second. Second. Second by Philip. Any further discussion? Gary, now we call for vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. 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 Thank, Thank you all for being patient. So, so this, this is, is a rezoning for the High School Division. Uh, J.J. Kerber Homes. We have the owner of J.J. Kerber Homes here. here. Courtney, Courtney and, and Jeff Pace. Pace. Yeah. Oh, so brother, brother, brother. Wait a minute. 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 I don't, I don't know if all of you are familiar, familiar with the location, the location they're wanting to do this if you are. Glad to have the details right there. They go to. They're, 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 they're ready, ready, to, ready, ready to keep going, going on this. Uh, we've worked, worked hard, hard on them for months, months maybe even, even here more now, it seems. And, and so uh, we, just we just need to get, get an ordinance here to present the rezoning of this. They've already went before the planning commission. Right? That was just approved. So this is kind of. It's one of their last, last steps, steps to getting in. Just, just any idea when you're ready, ready to break ground. ground. Uh, this there, there you go. go. Well, that's well, very exciting. exciting. How, many How many homes do you anticipate maybe in this site, roughly? 81 homes. 81 homes. So, so pretty, pretty, pretty accurate, rough, rough at all. That's fantastic. fantastic. So, so, you know, we've, we've got, got a lot, lot of great things going on in this county, in this community. And I want to thank you all. I know it's a good group. For your interest, interest and your investment, investment in, in Perry County, County and Bell City. So, uh, fantastic, fantastic news, I think. think. So, so, this, this ordinance, ordinance um, 1189. 1189? Yes. Okay. okay. Um, if there are any, any questions, questions on this before we read this, this is for case or anybody? Larry, 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 so, so if there are no questions, questions I'll go in and move for the, the first reading, reading order 1189. I'll make that motion. Motion made by Julie. Julie. Here's a second. 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 Second by Larry. Any further discussion? Any none? All in favor? 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 All Legal description is the bulk of this document. I'm not going to read the entire legal description of the survey. Uh, there's only people that might like to fight with our attorneys. So, uh, uh, so uh, 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 yeah, yeah, uh-huh. Here, 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 Said commission has certified its favorable recommendation to the Common Council of the City of Kell City, Indiana, to approve development of Hoosier Heights subdivision and certain amendments and changes to the zoning map of the City of Kell City. And whereas the City of Kell City Common Council has now considered the petition for amendment of the Master Plan Code filed with the Kell City Advisory Plan Commission as docket number 2021-002-DP-ZA. Now therefore be it ordained by the Common Council of Kell City, Indiana on the authority of the Indiana statutes as follows. Number one, section one, ordinance number 800 passed and enacted by the Common Council of the City of Tell City, Indiana, on or about November 7th, 1997, as amended, is hereby further amended in the following res respect. The zone map of Tell City, 1997, as identified in ordinance number 18 of, in order, number 800, I apologize, of the City of Tell City, which was amended by ordinance number 833, passed and enacted by the Common Council of the City of Tell City, Indiana, on August 2nd, 1999, shall be changed to designate the following described real estate located within the two-mile jurisdictional area of the corporate limits of the City of Tell City, Indiana as R3, Residential Multifamily District. Said real estate being more particularly described as follows. And I will note there is a legal description that encompasses the next three, four pages that describes... You're not going to read that, right? I am not going to. Okay. We'll let it slide. That describes... So you want to go to page six to finish up? I do. I'm trying to find it. 
on 33.046 acres more or less, which is available for viewing for the folks here and watching online and will be published. It is subject to the right of way of Old State Road 237 being 40 feet in width and lying easterly of and coincident with the center line of said roadway located along the westerly boundary of the above described parcel. Also subject to the right of way for Stem Road lying 15 feet on each side of the physical center line of said roadway and being located along the easterly boundary and running northeasterly and south southwesterly through the southeast portion of the above described parcel. Number three, section three, this amendment of ordinance number 800 of the city of Tell City, Indiana shall take effect on the date of its passage and approval by the mayor, passed and adopted by the Common Council of the City of Tell City, Indiana this 20th day of June, 2022. Okay, what is the rest of the stuff? I'm sorry, the certificate that has to do with the, this is the map entry. I would note, yes, I would note that yeah. a proposed map entry has been attached as well that includes the legal description of the real estate. And then it's got and a designation that it shall be changed from R1 low density residential to R3 residential multifamily. And a certificate um, for the clerk treasurer to certify um, that a copy of the proposed ordinance, the true and correct copy of the original thereof, and that that the ordinance as of the date of this certificate is in full force and effect and has not been modified or rescinded in any manner. Um, dated, dated as of today's, today's date, date uh, uh, we'll, we'll also, also publish it. All right, all right. Can we can add add first three 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 Ordinance number 1189 and ordinance amending the zoning map of the city of Tulsa, Indiana. Ordinance number 1189 and ordinance amending the zoning map of Tulsa, Indiana. Okay, I'll tell you guys first. Ordinance number 1189, I'm going to make a motion to adopt. All motion for approval. Motion to adopt. Second. 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 Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or they'll remember it for the right All right. So, so under new business, item C, or, or excuse me, item, item B, B, is the clerk treasurer request for new hire. Connie, if you want to, I'll let you finish writing right and I'll let you kind of breathe the council on the situation here. If you weren't at the last meeting, you it was discussed at the Water Board, which, no, that's at the Board of Works meeting Board of Works. with the Board of Works members. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I was approached by the superintendent from the Wastewater Department and the superintendent from the Water Department requesting that an employee that I have in my office, Shelly, that works part-time in my office and part-time in the utility office, they would like for her to go in and work full-time now in the utility office. They are, the wastewater department is doing some more mapping and things on their side that they, they need her over there. So I have agreed to, that she would go over there and that uh, I would like to, and this would all take effect June 25th is what we're looking at currently. And what I am asking is to if replace her in my office, I would like to replace her with a full-time employee. I feel that that position could be manned by a full-time person to do all the, the claims and the accounts payable and the capital to capital, all the capital assets. And I would like to give this person more of the HR responsibilities of like meeting with new employees when they come in and uh, just working with the insurance and that. Uh, workers comp, that's a, you know, we have comp claims, workers comp claims that we have to turn everything in on. And I think there's a lot of opportunities through IMPA, or IPEP, I always say that wrong, IPEP, where we could do some more, more training for like our street department guys and, and that where there maybe needs to be some training in that and they could also be in charge of that. So I would like to, I haven't put this out or advertised this position yet because I needed your approval to make this a full-time position in the clerk treasurer's office. Correct, they have. With, with the 
position of the dispatch center, center allocating, allocating a separate, separate budget, budget item. Yes. And, and, and with, with the American Rescue yes. Program. Yes. Uh, yes. So, so I would make, make that motion that that position be done with full time position. Got a motion made by Larry. 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 Second. 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 Second.
covers the cost of providing service. Um, and it also tells us any subsidies that are going on between rate classes. And it uh, also tells us the level of each charge in a rate. So it's going to tell us what the customer charge should look like. It's going to tell us what the energy charge should look like. It's going to tell us what a demand charge should look like. So it produces you know, quite a lot of, of good information that we can use to design rates. So the study itself, we use what's called neighbor, what's called, <laughs> what's called the NARUC methodology. And NARUC stands for the National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners. And it's considered industry standard practice for cost of service studies. They actually produce a, uh, an electric cost allocation manual that defines um, what they consider to be industry standard allocation practices for a cost of service study. Uh, but basically, the study consists of three steps, functional assignment, classification, and allocation. And this uh, chart kind of depicts each step. So functional assignment is just organizing the costs by what type of costs they are. Are they purchase power related, primary distribution, secondary distribution, um, line transformers, uh, customer service, et cetera, et cetera. So we're, we're organizing the costs based on what type of cost it is. Classification is a further organization of those costs by what's driving the cost on your system. In other words, what's causing you to spend the dollars. Is it related to the amount of kilowatt hours that you're selling? Is it related to the number of customers that you have to serve? Or is it related to demand or capacity that you have to build on the system? And then finally, the third step is to allocate those organized costs to each class of service. And you do that based on how it's classified. So if it's a customer-related cost, it'll be allocated on number of customers. If it's an energy-related cost, it'll be allocated on the number of kilowatt hours that each class uses. So uh, it's a pretty straightforward process. Uh, it's a lot of calculations, but it's a pretty straightforward process. Um, that's hard to see, but we looked at revenue requirement, which is the second step in all this. We looked at it two different ways. Um, <clears throat> there's a rate of return approach, uh, which is this top part. And the rate of return approach yielded an increase of about $1,485,000, or about an 8.8% 8 .8 increase. The bottom part, we did the revenue requirement based on budget. And using the budget approach, we got a slightly lower number of $1,433,000, or about an 8.5% increase. So where we ended up is something closer to the budget approach uh, as opposed to the rate of return approach. And, and let me say, if you have any questions, just stop me at any time. You know. So you're projecting a loss without a rate increase? Um, yeah. Yeah, if you remember the budget got back, back in November or December, we were projecting a half million dollar loss at that point. Oh, okay. So yeah. And that's going to grow with the additional expenses that's anticipated. So where we ended up, if you look at that last column there, we ended up at 1436095 Now that is an increase over the test year rates. And that's an important distinction here. Because some of that increase is purchase power related. Okay? Okay? You have a purchase power mechanism that automatically passes through increases in purchase power costs. So some of those increases you're already currently billing. So the full 1436095 would not be an increase compared to what you're billing today. If you compare it to what you're billing today, 
the increase is this column right here, which is 1,019,746. So that is the increase compared to what your bills look like today, which already includes some increases because of the purchase power. And that's about just slightly under a 6% increase. Any questions about that? Okay. So <clears throat> in terms of the rate design, in order to yield that increase, um, if you look at, you know, we're showing the rate class here. This is the current rate, that is the proposed rate, and then this column shows the increase, decrease in the charge. What we're proposing to do is put most of the increase in the customer charge and the demand charges. The energy components, if you notice, in most cases actually drop slightly. Uh, I think there's one exception to that. Um, but if you look at residential uh, A there, it currently has an $18 customer charge. And then when you add the energy charge in the rate with the current power cost adjustment that you're billing, it's an energy rate of 12.591 cents per kilowatt hour. And what we're proposing is a $28 customer charge and a drop in that energy charge to 12.407 cents per kilowatt hour. Commercial, same kind of situation. Uh, currently, it's an $18 customer charge and 12.211 cents per kilowatt hour. We're proposing to go to a $28 customer charge which, with 11.85 cents per kilowatt hour energy charge. And now, are those commercial, is that small businesses? And then? Yeah, our, our rate B class is going to be your single phase businesses and uh, garages. Okay. Okay. Three phase currently has a $40 customer charge and an 11.876 cent energy charge. And this is the one exception where the energy charge doesn't drop. Uh, we're proposing to go to a $55 customer charge with 13 and a half cent energy. And then F1, three phase, also has a $40 customer charge, um, but it has a, it's a demand rate. So it has an energy component of 6.456 cents and a demand charge of $9.03 per, per KVA. And we're proposing to go to $55, uh, drop the energy to 6. percent one five cents per kilowatt hour and raise the demand charge to eleven dollars and four cents and then the flood wall pumping rate uh, same forty dollar customer charge five point eight cent energy eight point eight seven dollar demand charge and we're proposing to go to a fifty five dollar customer charge drop the energy to 5.719 cents per kilowatt hour and raise the demand charge to $10.74. And then large power um, currently has a $350 customer charge, an energy charge of 3.807, uh, demand charge of $24.47 per KVA. And we're talking about leaving the customer charge alone here, um, dropping the energy slightly to 3.757 cents per kilowatt hour, and raising the demand charge to $26.45. And then on large power E2, um, the only thing we're proposing to change is to increase the distribution demand charge from $2.50 to three dollars and that change pretty much offsets the reduction in the um, URT dollar. Charles, are any 
Any questions about any of those? Okay. This one's a little harder to see, and I'm not going to read through all these, but. Uh, you got to copy that. Yeah. Uh, the mayor printed copies of all Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yes. Yeah. These are the proposed lighting changes. Um, and. Um, So they're going to vary, you know, by light. I'll give you a minute to kind of look through those a little bit. And we're not adopting anything tonight. This is information. I don't have anything to adopt ordinance-wise. So it'll be on next month's, the July 5th council meeting for consideration. This, this is time to ask questions. And I know a couple of you already sat down with Andy. I recommend all of you sit down with Andy or Paige if Andy's not available or JB or Joe, any of you, and, and talk to them about these questions. I mean, it's a lot to take in. Yeah. So these slides show the dollar impact of the changes at different usage levels. So, um, you know, for example, they're residential at uh, zero usage is um, ten dollars per month or a hundred and twenty dollars a year at a thousand kw it's eight dollars and thirty eight dollars and sixteen cents a month or ninety seven eighty eight so those are going to show you um, the various bill impacts um, at different consumption levels and you may have answer this question when I met with you, but I can't recall it. What is the average residential bill? Yeah, yeah so I was not asking that for there when we talked about here. <laughs> um, our average residential bill is far around 1,000 kilowatt hours. I think our average is around eight to 900 kilowatt, okay. kilowatt hours a month for our average residential usage. Okay. Um, so most of our customers are looking at that about an $8.16 increase per month next year versus this past year. Um, and I will say this, with the tracker resetting, um, and this is the tracker <laughs> change, but over the next three months, they're actually, those customers, that rate's gonna go down to $6. So they're actually getting a credit. Um, so with us resetting our tracker, the cost has come out, the new tracker is actually less than what our base rate was set at. So most of these customers will see another 2 to $3 decrease from this, this, this column right here. Okay, so let's let's talk a little bit about the customer charges because we've proposed, like I said, uh, most of these increases are in the customer charge and the demand charge. Um, and if you look at the results of the study, uh, this is a comparison of where your current customer charge is compared to what the cost of service study cost basis for the customer charge was. So for single phase residential, single phase commercial, you're currently at $18. The study uh, says the cost for that charge is $32.74 for residential and $34.82 for commercial. 
And if you look at those three phase uh, commercial accounts there that are $40, um, the cost of service study says that that customer charge should be somewhere around $71.50. And then the last two, your charge is actually above what the, uh, uh, what the study suggests that it should be. Um, and I typically don't like lowering customer charges, so I didn't propose to lower those. Uh, instead, just hold them where they are. Um, the importance of customer charges is a couple things. Um, one, the more cost-based the, more, the closer your rates are to what the cost of service study says the costs are, the more fair and equitable the rate is going to be. Okay, So it, it's important to try to keep those charges moving toward costs at all times and don't let them lag uh, because it does create subsidies within a class. And for example, <clears throat> those customer costs are things like meter reading and billing, customer service, um, the O&M on the meter, those kinds of things. In other words, there are costs that exist because there's a customer there. Not, it has nothing to do with the amount of kilowatt hours you sell or the capacity that you're building, okay? So if you put that in the energy charge, which is where it goes if you have a customer charge that's below cost basis, it ends up in that energy component. Then if I'm above average user, I tend to overpay for those. Mm -hmm. If I'm a below average user, I tend to underpay for those. So it creates equity considerations in terms of rate design. Um, the second thing is that um, revenue volatility for the utility. In other words, those are fixed costs that, at least in the short run, don't go away. So they exist irrespective of the weather. And to the extent that you recover those costs in a variable component that's subject to weather variation versus a fixed component like a customer charge, it creates revenue volatility and uh, margin, if you will, or the ability to fund certain projects, volatility in that, uh, because it's going to be somewhat based on um, the weather that you get each year. Um, and another thing that goes along with that that a lot of people don't think about, but it has the same effect on customers. So in other words, the, the more you put in that energy component, the more the monthly bill volatility is. So as you get extreme weather or mild weather, the bill fluctuates a lot more. So if you're a lower fixed income kind of person that budgeting is important for, the high energy charges create much more bill volatility from month to month than high, than high customer charges and lower energy charges do. So I think there's a benefit in terms of low and fixed income customers from having a cost-based customer charge and a lower energy charge. <clears throat> um, in terms of the revenue variability, I wanted to give you an idea of the kind of dollars we're talking about. This is just residential. And if you take the difference between the $18 we're charging now and the $32.74 that the study says we should be charging, that's $14.74 difference that's built into the energy charge now instead of the customer charge. You sent out 42,336 residential bills in the test year. So that equates to $624,000 of fixed customer costs that's being recovered through the energy component, which means that to a certain degree, whether you get that or not is subject to weather variation. So it can be a big number. That's just one class. That's, you know, that's residential, but if you, you know, if you did it for all classes, it's $800 million. You know, I don't know exactly, but it's, it's, a, it's a big number. Um, and then finally, <clears throat> we talk a lot about subsidies and equity. So I wanted to show you, because um, one of the things we try to accomplish 
with the increases is to improve equity and rates um, after the increase compared to before the increase. And what that means in terms of cost of service studies is how consistent are those rates of return. In other words, the more consistent those rates of return are from class to class, the more equity you have in your rates. So what we try to do is these negative rates of return, this is the before, we try to bring those up so that what we're left with after the increase is something that's a little more consistent than where we started out. So we're reducing the subsidies, we're not eliminating them, um, but we're balancing, um, you know, reducing those subsidies with the bill impacts that we have to uh, incur on people in order to uh, reduce those subsidies. So it's kind of a, it's a balance between those two considerations. And that is my last slide, so if you have any any questions or anything you want to discuss, we can, uh, we can do that. Council, any questions? Uh, again, this will be on your agenda for July 5th, considerations. Um, I guess you'll have the ordinance prepared and sent to me so I can send up to Council prior to that night, right? But you agree with that's a problem. That's a problem. <laughs> that's a problem. That's a problem back in 2020. <laughs> that one brought it with us. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to read. Uh, okay. Send it. Yeah, send it to John and I. Could you move and send out to the council? I got to practice reading. Could you move and send out to the council so they have it? That would be great, too. I mean, that, I think they'd appreciate it. I, I would uh, <laughs> credit to Gary who brought up this point. If you were making this presentation over at Evansville,
Twenty-two dash thirteen. Thirteen, yes. Getting good. I apologize. Did, did I get this done in time today? That it did get sent out. Yeah, they all got copies. I don't know okay. if it got sent out to, but they got copies out. Freaking out when I pulled that thing out. Take a, take a USB, <laughs> put one in. It just, just, it's just, just having, a, having a fit, I'm telling you. Okay, what I have here for you all this evening is a resolution uh, 2022-13, and it's to it was in the general fund, and I would like to transfer three thousand five hundred eighty-seven dollars within the parks budget from seasonal personnel to league support. And what this is, this is for the uh, league director. Usually we have paid that position and on a salary basis, but this year there the softball and baseball league is asking if we would just not send them this money. They'll put it with their money to pay the league director because they also pay money to the league director. And so this will get it. We won't have to pay taxes on it or anything like that. It'll just be we turn it over to them to pay the other part of the league director's salary. This is what was budgeted in the salary ordinance for, for this, this year, year was the 3587 that the city was going to contribute to that person's salary. This is just one person. Just one person, yes. It's Brandon Law. He's doing, he's doing, he's doing that also is the, the lead director. Yes, multiple hats, yes. So, so council, council resolution 2020-13, uh, resolution by the South South City Common Council, council to make necessary transfers from the minimum by five to eight agencies to the general budget to the general budget to the general budget to the general Second. 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 Second.